Dominion and dynasty. The land promise is fulfilled. Joshua emphasizes that in an initial way. And we, we see this theme of rest in the land. So we see that Sabbath theme being picked up, right? The, the rest theme from the seventh creation day. Where, where does Israel rest? Uh, it rests in the land. It rests in God's presence. It rests in the place God gives them. Clearly, clearly Joshua emphasizes God's grace and sovereignty and power that um, all the victories, all the victories are from the Lord, right? You don't, it's, it's slightly ridiculous and even laughable if they weren't terrified to watch people circle a fortified city every day and then walk around it seven times. I mean, if that were, you know, obviously our battles are very different today, but if an army were to do that, right, it would lead to derision and scorn and mockery. But of course, the whole point of the story is God's winning the victory, right? The, the victory is the Lord's. And uh, so that Joshua is all about that. One battle after another, the Lord, the Lord brings them victory. A um, couple other things. A very important passage in the book. When Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua approached him and asked, are you for us or for our enemies? What side are you on? <laughs> Neither, he replied. I'm not on either side. <laughs> I have now come as commander of the Lord's army. I'm, I'm the king. I'm in charge. Then Joshua bowed with his face to the ground in worship and asked him, what does my Lord want to say to his servant? The commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, remove the sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did that. So very much like Moses in the wilderness, right? Joshua is the servant of the Lord, of the angel of the Lord. He serves at his bidding and at his command. And if, to remove any sense from Joshua that, that you're the ultimate leader here. You're not the ultimate leader. When, you know, when, you, when you're in charge of something, when you're the leader, it's very easy for arrogance and pride to enter in, isn't it? And the Lord reminds Joshua at the outset, you're, you're my servant. And that's, that's a good thing to remember as, as we serve in ministry, right? We, we, serve, we serve the Lord Jesus Christ, finally. We serve, we serve our God. We're not, we're not, we, are, we are leaders, but we're accountable. We're accountable to the Holy One of Israel. And, and, and we see, you know, we see uh, indications that Israel can only prosper if they obey. They can't, they can't enter the land until they're circumcised, right? Until they follow the covenant sign. When, when Achan sins at I, they lose. Um, so obedience is important, and the book ends with covenant renewal. But um, the, the book of Joshua is a very optimistic book, isn't it? And yet it ends with some clouds on the horizon, right? Because we're told not all the inhabitants are destroyed. And, and Joshua, at the covenant renewal, says, Joshua 24, 19, you're not able to serve the Lord. You know, you might, you, you might think he'd end the book by saying, look, we're going from strength to strength here. We've entered the land and paradise is right around the corner. But he kind of gives them a dark message, doesn't he? You are to serve the Lord. You're to belong to him entirely, but you won't be able to do it. Well, that's Joshua. So Joshua, in 10 minutes, you know, I'm not going to keep saying this, you know. Well, I can... I think I would say, where is that text, right? Um, is it the end of chapter? Oh, I guess you can't put the period there. Yeah, I don't remember the exact verse. Let's see if I can find it. So it's not there. Where does it say all the promises are fulfilled? Is it the end of chapter 23? Are you tracking 
25. Oh, that, it's at the end of 21. Yeah, okay. I thought it was the end of 22. So the Lord gave Israel all the land he had sworn so to give to their fathers, and they took possession of it and settled there. The Lord gave them, so these are very important verses in the book, right? The Lord gave them rest on every side. There's our theme of rest. According to all that he had sworn to their fathers, none of their enemies were able to stand against them, for the Lord handed them over, handed over all their enemies to them. None of the good promises the Lord had made to the house of Israel failed. Everything was fulfilled. So I think, I think from the standpoint of the author, we don't know who wrote Joshua. Maybe Joshua did. Who knows? Uh, but from the standpoint of the author, the land promises are fulfilled. Yes, they're fulfilled. And, and, but at the same time, there's a sense in which there's more to come. At least the universal blessing isn't fulfilled. So he seems to see the land promises as fulfilled, but I'd say yes, but. Yes, but because that's where I go back to they're fulfilled, but not all the inhabitants are destroyed. There's some issues going on here, right? So it's, it's fulfilled. All God's promises are fulfilled, and, and yet there's still a sense it's not the complete fulfillment. Does that make sense? Yeah. Anything else on Joshua? Okay. Judges. Well, it's evident that worldwide blessing won't come soon. What is Judges about? It's about Israel needing a king. When I was doing my research on this book, I was so struck by how many Old Testament scholars say that Joshua is not about needing a king. And I just totally disagree with that. Now, a lot of them say it is about needing a king, but I just think that's so obvious in the story. It's just fascinating how things go. But Joshua is, I mean, Joshua, Judges is about Israel spiraling downwards, and progressively deteriorating. So Israel, Israel needs the king, right, of Genesis 49, 8 through 12, Numbers 24, 17. And that, we're going to see that in Ruth and First and Second Samuel. So I like to say Judges begins with an optimistic note, but crashes with a thud. <laughs> um, Israel didn't drive out those they were supposed to drive out. And I forget who I'm quoting here. He's from, it's in my book. If Israel lives among the Canaanites, it likely will not be long before Israel begins to live like the Canaanites. Uh, that is a great line. And uh, that's what Judges is about. And of course, that, is, that, is that a message for believers today? Of course it is, isn't it? that uh, our culture, in our culture today, the, the secular influence is very powerful. It's very powerful in the church, isn't it? And we begin to live like the Canaanites. How does it show up most profoundly in our culture today? In our divorce culture. In our divorce culture. People in evangelical churches, I don't know about your communities, but in the communities I'm aware of, people in evangelical communities often are getting divorced. Now, I, th I think there are some legitimate reasons for divorce and remarriage. I mean, sexual s infidelity, sexual sin, pornea, sexual sin, and desertion. But many people are divorcing and remarrying apart from those issues. <laughs> and, uh, and, and typically our churches don't discipline them. They don't do anything. Uh, you know, I'm, there, there are many churches where a person divorces, a spouse, brings a new girlfriend into church, a wife, then they're sitting together, the wife is there too, nothing's said, nothing happens. Well, that's, that's Canaanite thinking, isn't it? That's Canaanite thinking invading, invading the church. The new generation didn't know the Lord or what he did for Israel. So that's your task, isn't it? I mean, ultimately you can't do it, but the new generation's coming up Will the new generation know the Lord? That's, that's the task before us in each generation to pass that baton to, of faith. It didn't happen. They didn't, apparently, they didn't teach their children to love, fear, and hold fast to the Lord the way they were enjoined to do. So like another person says, Israel was in the land, but not in the Lord. And so you see the cycle in Judges, right? Israel disobeys, 
foreign nations judge them, they repent, and they're delivered, and it happens over and over. We have the judges in Israel. The word judges, uh, the word judges really means saviors, deliverers. It comes from the word savior, um, and, and actually the word judging in, is, in, in the Old Testament often has the idea of ruling, right? When you judge, we, uh, we think only of trials, but judges had rule, and, uh, and, they, and, and, the, and they ruled the people. And, and judges is all about deliverance happening through unusual people, through their left-handed ehud. You know, left, left-handedness was a, was, a, was, a, was a different thing, you know, and I have two, two of our four boys, or uh, two of our four kids, we have one girl, uh, are left-handed. You know, it's interesting even to hear people who are a little bit older where people tried to correct that. <laughs> oh, you're a left-hander? When they tried to make them be right-handed. I mean, I don't, I don't know if that happens anymore. It shouldn't. <laughs> but, you know, you have a left-handed deliverer, and you have a woman, Deborah, and so forth and so on. You have Gideon, and, and we, we won't tell all the stories here, uh, but it's, it's quite, quite interesting. Uh, of course, Samson and Abimelech, who is awful. Um, let's talk about Samson for a minute. Samson, Samson, like Israel, had a supernatural origin. He was set apart. So see, Samson's story is the story of the nation, right? Samson had a supernatural origin. He's set apart by the Lord. He has a distinctive vocation, but he forsakes the Lord. Well, his story is Israel's story. It's not, just, it's not just his private story. But at the end of the day, the Lord is still with him. This is sort of the whole book of Judges. He hasn't abandoned the people. So Webb says, Barry Webb says, Israel falls for foreign gods like Samson falls for foreign women. I love that. Uh, that's great, isn't it? That's a great way of putting it. And just as God did not abandon Samson, so he didn't abandon, abandon Israel. Isn't it fascinating I worked with an Old Testament professor who said this wasn't true, who said that, he, he, he said uh, at one point, I won't say the name, but he said, hey, Samson didn't have faith, but Hebrews said he did. Hebrews, isn't that interesting that Hebrews celebrates Samson's faith with, <laughs> with all his problems, with all his problems. But uh, is, that, is that actually in the story of uh, Judges? Is that just Hebrews making things up? I don't think so, because the narrator tells us in Judges that his hair began to grow again. And the hair is his strength, right? That's definitely not happening for me. So, <clears throat> but fortunately, it's not my strength. Uh, but the, 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 the hair began to grow again. Yahweh is still with him. When he puts his hands on the pillars, we already know from the Delilah story, if the Lord isn't with him, nothing's going to happen, right? Right? If the Lord's not with him, he can push all he wants on those pillars. But he, he dies, what, in faith, doesn't he? He dies trusting in the Lord. So Judges is, in some ways, pretty depressing, but it's not, uh, Israel isn't abandoned. <clears throat> and, then, and then the end of the book. Let's see. Israel needs a king. Over and over again, we see that refrain, don't we? In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did whatever seemed right to him. And in those days, there was no king in Israel, 18.1. And uh, where, do, where do the other places we see that, 19.1? in those days when there was no king in Israel. And then, of course, at the end of the book, we read it again. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did whatever seemed right to him. Of course, there you see his narrative skill at work, don't we? I mean, how do you read a narrative? You read it different than you read an epistle, right? And one, one way you, you can tell a story 
and impress a point upon the reader is by repetition at key junctures in the story. And, 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 and especially how you end a book. I mean, that's just hermeneutically very significant, isn't it? So he ends the book by ca calling attention uh, to this theme. So uh, quite remarkable. What, what's Israel's problem? Israel's problem is they need a king. And we see, we see this uh, with the tribe of Dan. The tribe of Dan attacks and destroys a, a peaceful town up north which was not bothering anybody. Uh, they should have followed Deuteronomy 20. They didn't. Uh, the Levite, the Levite they take is the great-grandson of Moses who's involved in idolatry. Yes, so the, 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 the children, the great-grandchildren are not following the Lord. Um, chapter 19, right, when... Uh, when the person with the concubine comes through Gibeon and Benjamin, the way the narrator tells the story, he repristinates what happened at Sodom, right? So the, the way the story is told, Israel has become like Sodom, wanting to have sex uh, with uh, the visitors who are there. So uh, things, are, things are very bleak. So, so here we are, you know, 1,400 years, 1,400 B.C., say, let's say, let's pick that date, and we come, we come to the time of the judges, so we talk about, you know, to 1,100, 1,000 B.C., so three or 400 more years go by, right? So they have, we have the offspring. They're in the land. How are things going? Are they becoming a universal blessing? No, they can't even keep things together themselves, <laughs> right? They can't, they, they can't live under Yahweh's lordship themselves. They're, they're, they're always on the cusp of disaster. So, uh, you know, another hundreds of years are going by. I mean, just think back. Let's think back to, right, 1600. Just imagine 400 more years going, going back and, and things aren't progressing a great deal. So, again, the storyline is quite remarkable, isn't it? It's advancing so slowly, and Israel is not, is not doing well. Well, anything you want to say about judges? You know, God seems to look at their desire for a king in a negative light because he says that they're rejecting me as king. Yeah. So how do you just reconcile those two ideas then? Yeah, I will, I'll come to that when we come to 1 Samuel, but that's a great question. Absolutely. Fab fabulous question. Yeah. Anything, anything else? Can you tell me anything on uh, your thoughts on the kidnapping of the woman from China? You mean for the Benjamin Knights? Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, I think, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a tough passage, right? And, uh, you know, the, I, I think what they did was fine. And I believe we should still do that today. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. So <laughs> that is a joke, right? No. But I think it was a particular cultural situation. I think they sought the Lord. I think he gave them wisdom. I mean, that's not a repeatable sort of event. It's a very different culture or a different context. But, I, but the way I read the narrative, the, I think the narrator thinks that was a good thing. Now, some may disagree with that. I'm not... Uh, you know, I always say about a controversial issue, if I start getting persecuted for it, I'm just going to give right in, you know? Like, you know, if Al Moore came to me and said, if you keep holding that view, I'll fire you, I'd say, you know, I don't think I'll hold that view. <laughs> so, <laughs> because I don't really, I'm not really invested in that question. It's a tough issue, right? So, I mean, if it's clear, but that's not the clearest issue uh, of all, you know, so... We don't ask that question of new members who come into Clifton Baptist Church. But that's a, it's a good question. I've talked way too long about this, haven't I? So anyway, do you, you, you want to come back to me on that? Is, that? is that okay? Yeah, okay. Anything else? Yeah, some very strange stories in there, right? Yeah, some fascinating things. Okay, well, let's go to Ruth. So, you know, here I want to say a word about the ordering of the canon. 
A lot of people doing biblical theology today think we should follow the Hebrew order. Jim Hamilton, uh, which is the other book, if you've already read my book, argues that. Peter Gentry, with whom I teach, would argue that. Stephen Dempster, Dominion and Dynasty, would argue that. And, um, you know, I'm following the, the English order, follows, you know, really the Alex X, a Greek order. So there, there's some debate about this, but I agree with Brevard Childs. And Childs says, look, the manuscript evidence is such that the ordering isn't so clear. It, I don't think it's, and, and here I'd go against some of those who say it is so clear. So I, I agree with those who say both orders are legitimate. And we can do biblical theology from both orders. And Ruth is a good example of that. For example, in the Masoretic text, Ruth follows Proverbs. And it's often pointed out, Ruth is the noble woman of Proverbs 31. Amen and amen. That's a very good connection, isn't it? Well, you can make that connection now without following the order, <laughs> right? If you want to follow the order, it's maybe a bit clearer to make that connection. But also, I think it's significant that Ruth follows judges because here, here is an indication of what a king is coming, <laughs> right? There are bright spots in Israel. So I think Ruth works both ways. You make up your mind on that. 